Hello everyone, Sula here of Sula's Big Adventures, and this is chapter 15 of my complete video guide to becoming an amateur astronomer. Chapter 15, Nebulae, where stars are born and die. Nebulae is just the plural of nebula. Some people like to say nebulas. I prefer nebulae, and that's what I'm going to say, but you can say nebulas if you prefer. A nebula is an enormous cloud of dust and gas occupying the space between stars and acting as a nursery for new stars. The roots of the word nebula come from Latin, meaning a mist, vapor, fog, smoke, or exhalation. And nebulae are made up of cosmic dust, basic elements such as hydrogen that's either been ionized or neutral or molecular and other gases. Nebulae can form either from clouds of cold interstellar gas or from the remnants of a supernova. For example, in the Carina Nebula, hot young stars erode and sculpt the clouds into this fantasy landscape by sending out thick stellar winds and scorching ultraviolet radiation. The low density regions of the nebula are shredded while the denser parts resist erosion and remain as thick pillars in the dark, cold interiors of these columns, and new stars continue to form there. Carina Nebula is in the southern hemisphere, and the James Webb Space Telescope recently got a fabulous picture of it. In the process of star formation, a disk around the protostar slowly accretes onto the star surface and part of the material is ejected along jets perpendicular to the accretion disk. And the jets have speeds of several hundred miles per second. As these jets plow into the surrounding nebula, they create small glowing patches of nebulosity called Herbig Haro, HH objects. As with most things in the heavens, Many people can claim the title of the discovery of nebulae. The first mention of it may have been in 964 by Persian astronomer Abd al-Rahman al-Sufi, who wrote about the Andromeda galaxy, noticing a little cloud. Early Arabic and Chinese astronomers also noticed the creation of the Crab Nebula, M1, as a result of a supernova in the year 1054. It wasn't until the 17th century and advances in optics that nebulae became more observed. In 1610, Nicolas Claude Fabry de Piresque discovered that the Orion Nebula. The first detailed observations, though, waited for famous scientist Christian Huygens, I think that's how you pronounce it, a Dutch astronomer, in 1659. Huygens was the first to come up with a standard formula for centripetal force, which he published in 1659. About 50 years later, Edmund Haley wrote about six different nebulae. He was also a very accomplished scientist, and he had a famous comment named after him. Famous astronomers flocked to nebulae over the years. Edwin Hubble helped categorize nebulae based on the spectral of light that they produced, and he also discovered that nearly all nebulae are associated with stars and are illuminated by starlight. Some nebulae are bright enough to be seen with the naked eye. The Great Orion Nebula, for example, located in the Sword of Orion, the winter constellation, and in the summertime, the Lagoon Nebula, M8, in Sagittarius. Many others are visible through a telescope, depending on how many stars are around them to illuminate the dust clouds that form the nebula. Uh, it's often hard to differentiate some nebulae from the background stars if they are very diffuse. Through advanced space telescopes like Spitzer, the Hubble Space Telescope, and now James Webb Space Telescope, we have plenty of gorgeous imagery of nebulae. Most of these images are made using infrared and false color images, but there's no denying that they are striking. These images depict the wide variety of nebulae available for us to observe. All of them cover light years of distance in space. 
Some are wispy, like the Veil Nebula. Some are well-defined. But one thing you need to know is that if you go looking for nebulae in your home telescope, even a big 10-inch one like this, you're not going to see them in striking, striking technicolor or like images you may have seen from Hubble or James Webb or on YouTube or other internet searches. The human eye is just not sensitive enough to see the colors that a camera sensor can detect in long exposure photographs. When we look through uh, our eyepiece at a nebula, most likely we're going to see a gray misty patch. And if you have a very small telescope, <laughs> It's going to be a very faint misty patch. Only a few nebulae are bright enough to show some kind of colors. To my eye, Orion Nebula appears somewhat grayish bluish. For example, wow, just looking at the great Orion Nebula in my new LX90. 12 inch Mead Schmidt Cassegrain. And planetary nebulae can have colors such as the ghost of Jupiter, which has a distinct blue color. Oh, wow. Wow. That is really neat. How cool is that? I'm just looking at the Ghost of Jupiter, NGC 3242. It's in Hydra, and it's a planetary nebula, and that has nothing to do with planets, and it's known as the Ghost of Jupiter, even though it has nothing to do with Jupiter. <laughs> It was so named because when it was discovered by William Herschel, he thought that it looked like Jupiter. The most famous nebula of all is the Great Orion Nebula, M42 in Orion. And it is an emission nebula with four hot stars forming inside of it, known as the trapezium. And if you try to photograph the Orion Nebula, you'll find out how hard it is to not have the trapezium blown out because the Orion Nebula is so bright. The stars emit ultraviolet light, which ionizes the hydrogen atoms called H2. And these are sometimes called H2 regions. And they give off their energy as light in a narrow wavelength of 656 nanometers, which is in the deep red end of the spectrum, not visible to our human eye. In the telescope, though, the Orion Nebula will appear, uh, some people say greenish, but to me it looks sort of bluish, grayish. Our eyes are more sensitive to green than red, and Orion gives out light emission of hydrogen beta in certain discrete nanometers that generate oxygen that has lost two of its eight electrons, and this is called doubly ionized oxygen, or O3 like my O3 filter. If you put an O3 filter in front of your eyepiece, it will allow only these wavelengths to pass and no others, and that will improve the contrast of the nebula, but it only works on emission nebula. These filters will do nothing for reflection nebulae. These nebulae are just reflecting the light of a nearby star. So the light emitted by a reflection nebula is the same as the spectrum emitted by a star. And so an O3 filter won't help with the Pleiades or uh, other reflection nebulae. Reflection nebulae are more difficult to see than emission nebula, and they're often washed out by the nearby star. There are also dark nebulae, and they don't have any stars to illuminate them. So they appear as dark patches. And it's best to look for dark nebulae with a smaller telescope, like a 90 millimeter refractor or even 70 millimeter binoculars. And to find them, you're not gonna find them in your uh, go-to telescope. This is not a go-to telescope, but if you have a go-to telescope with a database of objects, it's not gonna have dark nebulae. 
They usually don't include dark nebulae. You will need to consult your Sky and Telescope star chart or Sky Safari, which also lists dark nebulae, or Orion's Deep Map 600. Some nebulae are where stars die, for example, planetary nebulae. They are a shell of gas expelled by a star near the end of its life. It takes thousands of years as the dying star expels fast-moving gas, and then it shrinks to a hot white dwarf the size of a small planet. There are about 3,000 planetary nebulae that have been cataloged. In, they're all in our galaxy. An example of a large, bright planetary nebula is the famous Ring Nebula, M57, in Lyra. Another famous nebula is the Dumbbell Nebula, M27, in Volpecula. Volpecula means fox, <laughs> which looks like, the, the nebula looks like, uh, some people say an apple core or dumbbell. Uh, use your imagination. <laughs> it's big, too. Um, some planetary nebulae are not so easy to see, such as the Helix Nebula, NGC 7293 in um, Aquarius. It is half the diameter of the moon, so it's huge, but it has a low surface brightness and it's difficult to see unless you're in a dark sky site. Massive stars end their lives in dramatic supernovas in a matter of minutes where the mass is blasted into space and the remainder collapses into a neutron star or a black hole. The most famous supernova remnant is the Crab Nebula, M1, in Taurus. And as I mentioned, witnessed in China in the year 1054. The Crescent Nebula in Cygnus is not a supernova remnant. It is a shell blown away by a super hot sun called the Wolf Rayet Star. The Veil Nebula in Cygnus is a supernova remnant, and you can vastly improve your view of it in a telescope with an O3 filter. There are many more nebulae for you to explore in the night sky, and we're going to look at some. Some of my favorites are the Blinking Planetary Nebula, NGC 6826 in Cygnus, the Blue Flash Nebula, NGC 6905 in Delphinus, and NGC 3242 in Hydra, the Ghost of Jupiter, which is not anything to do with Jupiter, and the Saturn Nebula, in NGC 7009 in Aquarius, to name just a few. But there are many others. So, get out there and find a few of your own. Now we're going to look at some nebulae. show you a picture will give you a false impression that that's what you're going to see and you're not. <laughs> this one is stunning. This one is one of the kind. It's a ring nebula M57, just a little bit south of Vega, and uh, it is in the Lyra constellation. This one looks like a ring and I don't know for why or for what reason. It's kind of like blinking. So <laughs> this is one of the kind. Wow! That's so far away. Oh my God. Oh my God. Wow!
Well, that concludes chapter 14, 15, <laughs> Nebulae, where stars are born and die. I hope you enjoyed it, and I'll see you in the next chapter. Until then, dark skies.